All right, so the first one is, at what age do you want to retire? I hope I never retire. How long does it take you to get ready in the mornings? About 40 minutes. What's your favorite mobile app? Spotify. Most embarrassing moment of your life? I forgot the topic of my speech at my, um, when I was in the eighth grade to run for class captain when I go on stage. Okay. Uh, mountains or beaches? Oh, mountains. What's the most useful mobile feature you can't live without? This mobile feature I can't live without would be um, GPS. Favorite color? Black. What time of day are you most inspired? Late at night. How many hours of sleep can you survive on? At least four. But that's not healthy, so I sleep longer. Fill in the blank. An upcoming tech trend is black. AI. The city in which the best kiss of your life happened. Oh, my goodness. Um, in, um, in sh Chicago. Okay. Pick one, Android or Apple. Apple. The biggest mistake of your career? Not getting into software sooner. How do you relax? I watch movies. How many cups of coffee do you drink per day? Zero. A habit of yours that you hate? I stay up way too late at night. The most valuable skill you've learned in life? To never give up. Cities or countrysides? Countryside because I live close to the city, so yeah. And the last one is your favorite Netflix show. It used to be House of Cards, but that was a while ago. I haven't watched any new ones lately. Okay. All right, so now we can go to the long questions. So you can answer these with as much ease as you like. Okay. As long as you like, okay. So the first one is, what's your take on the state of hybrid work and the increasing role of mobile? So, you know, the future of work will be hybrid. And uh, every company tends to have slightly different mandates. So some companies might say that let's make sure that we have people come in for two days a week. Some people don't have mandates. Some companies say come back five days a week. What we know for a fact is that there's gonna be a mixed mode of working. And the, um, the thing that's important with hybrid work is making sure that regardless of whether you happen to be in the office or away from the office, that no one feels left out as they're communicating. And my hope is that we don't regress back to pre-COVID days where everyone has to be in the office all the time, because I think it opened up the world quite a bit for creating opportunity for people in different parts that didn't have access to a certain location. And this whole concept of having access to opportunity just because you happen to be in a certain location seems archaic, and we should get past that. And so the next generation skill in hybrid that's gonna be really important is, you know, can you, as a leader, build relationships pe with people that are deep and meaningful without having ever met them in person. And I think the more we can do that, the better off we'll be as a society. Uh, that doesn't mean we'd ever meet in person. That just means that that should not be a prerequisite for people having access to opportunity or people feeling like they know someone. It's interesting you say that because there are uh, research, there's research that argues that younger people will get left behind in a remote environment because they won't have the same opportunity to build networking connections because they don't get to go to the office like their predecessors. Yeah, so that's a great, that's actually a very real risk, which is the, the early in career generations are the ones who could actually have the most amount of risk and suffer the most. But that's why it's so important that the next generation leaders and all of us actually, the current generation leaders, learn how to make sure that people can get engaged and feel the culture without having to come into the office all the time. And so, you know, I spend a fair amount of my time with the younger generation that's just coming into the workforce just to understand what their challenges are and uh, getting them engaged in conversations and not making them feel like uh, uncomfortable and having their opinion be solicited actively in a meeting 
those are going to be important skills to get that generation to feel comfortable that they are actually part of the of the solution rather than feeling like they they don't have um, uh, a safe space to go out and speak in. But that is a real risk. Because the next question is, what's the role of the automobile when it comes to hybrid work? So the, we've been thinking about this quite a bit, the role of the automobile and hybrid work, because the extension of the mobile office will be in the car. And so we just recently made an announcement um, around um, WebEx being available in uh, the Mercedes, the new Mercedes that's coming out. And uh, that's not the first one we've actually done in the past. We've done Ford as well, uh, and then Apple CarPlay. And so our goal over here is to make sure that we have as much uh, ability to have technology outfitted in these um, automobiles so that when people don't have a private place to go out and take a meeting and they want to take it from their car, that we've given them the least amount of friction way to go out and connect to whoever they want to connect um, you know, from their car. And so I think it'll play a pretty interesting role. And in fact, some of the vision that you see from some of these autom uh, kind of automobile companies is, is actually exciting because they're, they're starting to see how they can use the automobile at idle times when it's not being driven with utility. And that's something that's a new concept that I don't think has been thought about in the past, um, other than you know occupying space in a parking garage. So besides this, what else are automobile companies thinking of? So, for example, you know, uh, there's some really interesting vision that, you know, Ford has around uh, the, the Ford F-150, for example. Um, you know, can they think about uh, that as a home office for some folks when they don't have enough space? And, uh, you know, can you go out and work from there? Can it also charge your home? Because it's a battery uh, that can actually act as a backup generator for your home. These are kind of very, very different use cases for the automobile besides just getting you from point A to point B. And the technology that's starting to get packed into these things is pretty phenomenal. Uh, I'm a big car fan, so I love cars. And so I'm hoping that there's going to be much, much more innovation to come. So companies today have multiple cloud providers, hybrid workforces, and distributed networks. Uh, how can leaders best secure the modern enterprise in such an environment? Yeah, the way that we've seen this is, you know, the new modern era of architectures is going to be hybrid and multi-cloud. And what I mean by that is there's four major computers in the world. There's going to be uh, AWS, uh, there's going to be GCP from Google, there's going to be Microsoft with Azure in no particular order, and then there's going to be a private data center of some sort. You might even have uh, companies like Oracle with OCI, so on and so forth. So there's going to be a few computers in the world, which are these kind of cloud service providers. And in the past, what's happened is security historically has been all patchwork faced. So I have a new problem on one end and I created, there's a new company created to go out and solve that problem. There's another problem uh, for exfiltration. There might be a company created for that. There's another problem for lateral movement. There's another company created for that. And what we now see is uh, that's an untenable way. There's 3,500 vendors in security, but no one owns more than 5% of the market if you take out the, you know, uh, well, one or two vendors in the, in the space. And so it's, a, it's, it's an area of opportunity if you abstract out that patchwork of capability from the cloud providers and say that there's going to be a common security cloud layer that's going to sit above all of that and you can acquire and steer any and all traffic to any of the cloud providers while maintaining security policy as you can move from one cloud to the other. What that would give you is public cloud economics without the public cloud lock-in. And so we're pretty excited about playing a very substantial role in that as Cisco. Um, but the overall kind of um, goal over here is give people the flexibility in their architecture to not be locked into any vendor and be able to say, if I have a workload that was on AWS and if I wanted to move it to Azure, as I do that, that my security policy can be portable and does not have to get re-architected every single time I do that. And to what extent does this create the danger of monopolies in the market? It's actually to exactly obviate the danger for monopolies in the market so that you don't actually get locked into a vendor and you can have an independent, neutral third party that can abstract from the cloud service providers so that you don't actually get locked into a vendor and you don't have pricing pressure with that vendor. And because, you know, the thing, the reason people are going to multi-cloud is they don't want to get locked in. The reason they don't want to get locked in is because of pricing pressure, but it, historically, uh, for multi-cloud, one is too few and three is too many. Uh, and now what you have is the ability to get to a free marketplace where more and more 
cloud service providers can participate um, in a company's workload that can be distributed, which then creates more competitiveness and more innovation and more agility and all of those things that come with that. So how do you see this future of SaaS evolving and how do you plan to position Cisco to take advantages of those changes? You know, the way that I think the, um, the big risk in software shifted with SaaS from the buyer to the seller. And what do I mean by that? Historically, in the days of perpetual software, what would happen is you would sell the product and then after you've sold the product, there'd be a maintenance check collected every, every year, every quarter, whatever your kind of term is. But you never really cared about anything else of what the customer did. You kind of dropped off the product and you were done. Now, what's happened is the risk has shifted to the seller where if you don't, you're renting the software to the customer and if the customer does not adopt it and utilize it effectively, then they just won't renew the subscription. And if they don't renew the subscription, then you'll have a churn event. And in, in SaaS software, churn is a really important number to go out and look at. How many customers are you attriting, not just acquiring? So this, the sale of the product is no longer the celebratory event. The big celebratory event is when the adoption of the product happens and the value is realized. And so the, as you think about SaaS, the way that SaaS is going to evolve, that is the core fundamentals of SaaS. I think we're going to evolve SaaS with a lot of AI. And there's this big major kind of platform revolution that's, that's already started a few months ago, where, you know, if you think about when you move from mainframe to client server PC, uh, from mainframe to PC, then PC to client server, client server to the internet with SaaS. And now what you're seeing is this major shift that's going to happen with AI based experiences. Uh, and there'll be natural language, kind of language instructed. And, uh, you know, chat GPT has been a great kind of indicator of the kind of possibilities that are available, but there's going to be a lot of innovation that goes on in, in this space and user experiences will be materially altered. I think the uh, quality of, um, knowledge that can be, um, acquired will be materially altered. And one of the biggest skills that people will need to learn is not what the answer is to something, but how do you ask the right question to get the best answer? And so this whole no notion of uh, the prompt revolution will begin where you have a prompt and that prompt will, uh, the, you know, the whole prompt engineering kind of uh, area where the quality of question that you ask is almost more consequential than the, than the result because it's your quality of question will be the skill that will get you the best result. And, and what do you think of people who argue that, and what ChatGPT, for instance, has done, it released its API earlier, OpenAI released its API, and then ChatGPT learned from the softwares that were built on that API, and it can do what those softwares do, so they are rendered they're kind of useless now. So what do you think of that? Yeah, I think one of the challenges that uh, companies like OpenAI will have is this whole notion of intellectual property rights. You know, uh, what do you, at what point does, um, someone who just crawls the web and summarizes the web, give attribution of credit to the original content creators, right? And so um, that's very different from what I was talking about for large language models, which is how do you go out and create an experience that's different? But like, but that is a true risk. And frankly, that risk is a non-trivial risk because you'll have to figure out ways that Companies will say, hey, I'm, um, I'm a publication that actually makes money by going out and pro providing, you know, kind of long form content. And I don't want that to be kind of um, uh, just analyzed by, by something like a chat GPT and then summarize and I don't get any attribution or credit for it. Like that, there's, there's a whole industry that needs to be thought through on that front. And I'm not sure if it's the right thing to do. So like, I think there'll be a, a level of kind of policy and regulation and um, thought that needs to be put in place and what that um, model looks like to, uh, uh, to um, give credit to the publishers. Because in search, it was easy. You gave a link and that link pointed you back to the publisher. But if there's a summary to the link, even if you point, the, point to the link at the bottom, you've still taken away the core essence of what, that, what the value of that um, you know, kind of content publisher was. I think that's going to be a real issue. I think as a society, we haven't sorted out all the things that are going to happen. Uh, and this is, um, this is going to be very disruptive and there's going to be some foundational things that will have to be rethought through in society as we start to adopt AI. It's not all, all, uh, you know, kind of a bag of roses. There's going to be a bunch of things that we'll have to actually think through as well. Now I'm an optimist. I think things are going to be, you know, generally positive, but, uh, we have to make sure that these things don't go sideways. 
uh, and AGI will be the big kind of aspect which will um, which will also be interesting to see because once computers have emotion, um, you know, what does that do? And, and uh, with the wrong intent, uh, there, there could be a lot of damage that's done. So we have to think through this in a pretty tempered way as we um, as we move into it beyond the hype cycle. So the summary aspect of AI is interesting because do you assume at some point there would be a backlash against this rapid taking in of information by summarizing everything and people would be like, oh, actually, I prefer to read a long, lengthy, yeah. interesting article. And that is an experience that humans like to have. And has it been is it being taken away by the rapidness of AI? I think that's actually a, um, a problem that humans have been facing where if you think about, I don't know if any of the listeners have, as you have kids, you can actually start to see that this notion of the value of long form content um, tends to get uh, diminished in this world of extreme velocity of notifications. And it actually alters your brain chemistry where, you know, you, you have a little bit more kind of attention deficit just by the way that we are evolving as a species. So I do agree, summarization can be important and efficient, but there's value in actually taking the time to understand the nuance. And uh, sometimes nuance actually is what makes the difference. And so I'm a big believer in long form content. I don't feel like summary is the only way that we should learn, but it's inevitable. And it's something that we have to make sure that we actually adopt into our lifestyles as, as this happens. You can, one, one of the things I've learned is you can't fight a megatrend. You have to use it as a tailwind. Um, but uh, as you use it as a tailwind, you have to make sure that there's things that you can't over pivot on because there's value to, um, uh, to the way that society had evolved. Okay. So can you give us one example of a big challenge you faced in your role as EVP and GM of security and collaboration at Cisco and how you navigated it? I think the challenge and the opportunity tends to be in a company like Cisco, you've got, you know, I have 12,000 people on my team, is are you doing right by them by making sure that the right people are in the right jobs at the right time, right? Because usually when some individuals end up not doing as well and failing. It's not because it was their issue. It's chances are because you didn't put them in the right job, you know? And uh, so I tend to think a lot about how do you construct teams? What's the dynamic of teams? And what are people's superpowers? And how do you make sure that those superpowers are getting amplified? And the areas where they might have weakness, don't focus on getting someone to be out of their areas of weakness or improve on their areas of weakness to go out and do their life's best work focus on them actually 10xing their areas of strength so they can do the life's best work. And how can you create a platform and an environment where that happens in a safe space for them? Um, that's, that's what I think is probably the most challenging thing to do. Uh, and when done right, it's very gratifying. And when done wrong, you have no one but yourself to blame because um, the right person in the wrong job, you know, can, can actually have terrible results that come out of it. And how has this differed from the other companies you've worked at? Or what are some of the pivots you had to make when you joined this new organization? I think at Cisco, um, look, we've, uh, we're a large company and we're going through a market transition and a shift in the business model. Like we, we have multiple different business models and the previous companies I worked at, well, at EMC, I, we did have multiple business models as well, but at Box, it was a singular business model, a SaaS. Over here, you've got a hardware business model You've got a perpetual software business model, and then you've got a SaaS and subscription business model. And so it's not hard to have three business models. It's hard to have a distribution channel that can support all three business models through a route to market that you've already established. And so those are things that are kind of interesting to kind of navigate through. And But we've actually, as a company, I think done a fantastic job. We are now at about 44% of our revenue that comes from subscriptions. That was a very different number just a decade ago for Cisco. And so I think uh, credit to all of my predecessors that were there before me and uh, all the team and the work that they've done. But that is, um, that's pretty exciting to see. And I'd, I'd like to see, um, and so that's, that's also been the biggest opportunity, but it's also the biggest challenge because you're, you're moving a big ship, which takes a while. And while that's happening, um, not 100% of the people um, might be in agreement with you, but you have to be very decisive at some point and say, this is the direction we're going down. What you can have in a company of this size and scale 
is confusion. You have, you might be wrong, but you can't be confused. You know, so you have to make sure that you take the right, take the call decisively, and just understand that a certain percentage of those calls are going to be wrong. But you have to be more right than wrong, otherwise you don't deserve to be in the job. Okay, could you give us one example of a particular day in your work at this job that was that'd be interesting, a story to tell to our audience? An executive meeting, anything. It can be anything. Um, well, I think the days that are most interesting to me are when we come up with new product ideas that are fundamentally transformational to the market. You know, um, I'll give you an example. We, um, in the uh, collaboration WebEx team, we had this idea of doing a um, asynchronous video um, product, which is like rather than always having a synchronous meeting, wouldn't it be nice if you just recorded a video and sent it out? People could comment, they could upvote it, downvote it, all of those pieces, and have reactions to it. Uh, and you have right, the right level of permission. And we initially thought, hey, we should go buy something. And I never liked the idea of going out and buying something because you were late to market. Like, it's nice if someone has something, but it, you can't lose the ethos of building it. And so we decided that, yeah, it didn't seem like it was that hard a problem to go out and solve. And we could build it ourselves in a better way than what was there in the market. And this team this, um, you know, came up to me, this one leader came up to me and said, Jitu, I just need three or four people on a team and we'll get you this product in two and a half months. And typically at the company the size of Cisco, people start talking in large numbers, but great software is built by small teams, you know. And in Vidcast, we actually staffed a team of, you know, three people to start with and four people eventually, and they built an amazing product, which is now in the hands of tens of thousands of people. They built it within a matter of, you know, two and a half months for the first uh, alpha version that they had. And every, Every day, every week, they had new releases. And it, it, it's actually been so easy. And now, all of our communication that happens with my 12,000 people team, I give them an update. Like, for example, when I go back, I might give them an update on what I learned at Mobile World Congress. That'll be a vidcast I sent to my team. And 12,000 employees see it, and they can react to it, and they can give me comments, and they can have questions. And it's such a great collaboration tool, which is now a part of the WebEx suite and extended to everyone who uses WebEx. So. That's an example of a great innovation. There's so many such examples of teams that have done such a good job uh, in just making sure that they think creatively um, about you know, the problem and deconstruct it in a way. And that's the most gratifying part of the job is, can we build solutions that affect humanity at scale and fundamentally improve lives of people? And that's such a privilege to be a small part of that team. And so in the different roles you've held at different companies, how do you usually go about making your hierarchy structure or like who reports to you how many people do you have directly reporting to you versus how many under them and so on? Yeah, I think um, the people, I, I'm not a big fan of having very large number of people report to me, but I actually believe that having direct contact with people that don't report to me is very important. So I don't believe in the traditional management hierarchy where I cannot talk to someone because that person has a chain of command, right? And uh, I'll give you an example. So I have like, you know, eight or nine people reporting to me like anyone else, but I de most of my time I spend is not with my direct reports. I spend a lot of time with product managers and designers and engineers and talking about what they're building in product. I spend a lot of time with the go-to-market leaders and figuring out how we're gonna be able to take something at scale for distribution, um, you know, to the market. And, and that's a pretty important dynamic to keep in mind. So one of the things that we did that, that'll be interesting is we had done a design review when I first joined the company where I said, the individual product manager, the individual designer has to come in and show me and the individual engineer what they're building and taking to market. They're like, well, you're an EVP, you sit on Chuck's staff, we are not sure this, I'm like, no, I really want to see what the product is because the product's the soul of the company. If you forget that, then the rest doesn't matter. And initially what happened is, the person that was going to present to me would present to their boss, would present to their boss, present to their boss, present to their boss, and then they'd come to me and there's like four or five layers and that became, super inefficient and I, uh, then they figured out, I didn't even tell the team. I'm like, well, you have to figure out a way to do it, but I want to see the individual, you know, PM and designers kind of, kind of show me what they're building. Very quickly, they realized, hey, we learn at the same time that G2 learns and that's okay because we're all in a safe space and we're just going to debate ideas. When we talk about ideas, it's not a personal attack on anyone. Our goal is to singularly just build the best product that we can deliver to the market. 
And if that means that we're going to debate an idea, no one's going to take pride on being wrong, but they should take pride on making sure they have the best product out in the market. And no one's going to remember whose idea it was. All they'll remember is that they were part of a team that built a great, built a great product. And so that's an example of where it doesn't matter who works for you on your direct team. It matters how you engage at scale with the organization, which is what I, so I tend to have a group of at least 120, 130 people that I'm engaging with. Um, you can't engage with 12,000 people, but you do have um, a group of people. And I, I take a lot of my learnings from that group on how I instruct my thinking as I move forward. Last question for you is of a personal kind. What would you be doing in your life if not this right now? If I weren't um, uh, doing what I'm doing right now, I would, if, I, if it was a related field, I'd be a designer um, uh, or uh, in, you know, a designer for software or even an interior designer, I would have a lot of fun. Otherwise, uh, maybe a fitness instructor because that way they have an advantage. They cheat in life because they're constantly fit because that's the day-to-day -day job and so you don't have to worry about going out and being fit you're just fit all the time and i, I envy them